Hello, BookTube, and welcome to Victober 2023. Today is the 1st of October. That inaugurates uh, one of BookTube's best events, <laughs> Victober, uh, which celebrates all things Victorian. It celebrates Victorian literature. Uh, now, Katie at Books and Things has been masterminding this for years, and she has a whole, there are a whole bunch of bells and whistles. I think there's a Discord group. There are probably a heavy presence on Goodreads. There are prompts. There are all kinds of things like that. And I, if I can remember, I'll, if I, I'll look around for a, a one-stop video where you can see all the co-hosts and all the things that you should do for Victober. It's a lot of fun every year. I want to join in, but I will probably not be doing the prompts. I, uh, I tend not to do that. Instead, I think what I will do for October will be to do another thing that I tend to do on this channel, which is overdo things. I think I will just... Uh, cozy up to the Victorians for the whole of the month, and encourage you to do the same. I have mentioned many times on this channel and in lecture rooms before I made this channel and before there was a YouTube and before there was an internet, that uh, I think the Victorian era is the greatest outpouring of human creativity ever uh, in, the history of, in the history of the species. I think it dwarfs the Enlightenment. I think it dwarfs Periclean Athens. I think it dwarfs the Italian Renaissance. I think there's no real comparing. It's the perfect confluence of a, of greater and more widespread education, a hungrier public audience for the plastic arts, and also uh, the greater means of doing those, a greater, a greater means of making things. I don't know what the actual reason is. I'm perfectly content to just lay it at the feet of the namesake of the of the Victorian era, which is Queen Victoria. That is ten. That tends to be how we define the Victorian era, the reign of Queen Victoria, so 1837 to 1901. Every once in a while, you'll see people, and I've done it myself, who will extend the era backwards to the, to the Georges, to the Wicked Uncles, uh, thinking or maybe accurately seeing that there was some bubbling in the air, there was some, the, I think Victorian creative endeavors have a feel to them, no matter how varied they are. They're incredibly varied, but I think they they have a feel to them of a kind of a, an expansive deep breath, a joy that you get with a creative flourishing whenever, in whatever period it occurs. And you can see presentiments of that in, in the Georges and the Wicked Uncles, but Victoria brings it, you know, when this, this young dewy thing comes to the throne, that brings it to fruition in the late 1830s. And then you have just it rolling along decade after decade. And occasionally you will see people who will also want to extend it on the other end. They'll want to extend it to cover the reign of good King Edward. Edward VII was from 1901 to 1910. Uh, I don't like to do that myself because I'm a fierce, I'm a fierce devotee of the Edwardian era, which does not have a beloved book to event. <laughs> so for my purposes, I'm largely going to keep things to this, the usual strictures of Victoria's reign, the late 1830s to the turn of the 20th century. I don't know if it was having Victoria on the throne. I think probably not. It's probably just a handy signpost, an easy way to refer to it. The reason that I think it's probably not is because Whatever was happening in the Victorian era in England and Ireland was certainly happening everywhere else in the world. I, when I used to, to, to uh, lecture about this, I used to say, for the purposes of what we're talking about, we're going to talk about the Victorian era. We're still going to use that time frame. But we're not going to limit things to the reign of Victoria, to the people who were her subjects. We're not going to limit it to that, because this same effusion of creativity was going on almost all over the world. In France, certainly. Um, in Russia, oh my God, in Russia, certainly. Also in the United States. Uh, no offense to my beloved Washington Irving, but United States literature was born in this time period. Uh, nevertheless, for Victober, we will try to restrict ourselves. Because I, the, the few times that I've mentioned that kind of broader parameter on this channel over the years, uh, people have bridled at it, and that's fine. The Victorian era is largely considered English literature, Irish literature, Scottish literature, just about. So I wanted to give you uh, an overview in works, an essentials list, a starter kit for Victorian literature just in general. I looked around. I don't think I've ever done a Victorian starter kit. I think the closest I ever came was the Victorian episodes of the, the Western Canada starter kit. Uh, so we're going to go through. Uh, I don't know that you could call this a starter kit because there's some pretty heady stuff on here. 
but certainly essentials or starter. I'll, I'll probably call it a starter kit because you could you can't go wrong in understanding the Victorian era by reading these works, and they range all over the map. I thought we would start with so-called serious literature. Now, if you watch this channel, you know that I look with a squinty, suspicious eye on the distinction between serious literature and so-called non-serious literature. But for the purposes of this list, we'll start with serious literature and then we'll move on to other categories. And we're going to start serious literature with the greatest novel that was written in the strictly Victorian era and one of the greatest novels ever written in English, and that is Middlemarch by George Eliot. Uh, a big thing, the Victorians did love their long books, so, and that, that is partially a reflection of the fact that, uh, that attention spans were different in the... <laughs> My baby. She made her, her inaugural appearance on this channel during Victoria, uh, or during at least the Victorian starter kit. Uh, not only did the Victorians have a greater, a, a different, a much more generous and patient and elastic attention span than we do in the 21st century, but also it was a business model. It was the way you got books into the Moody's Library or sold from publishers was in multiple volumes. It was very much by bulk. Uh, so but it, I shouldn't stress the length of Middlemarch because this is incredible. It is a long book, but it is amazingly good. Uh, I've recommended it so many times on this channel. And we'll stick with uh, so-called serious literature. We'll do Wuthering Heights. Of course, the Bronte sisters are a fixture of Victorian reading lists. Wuthering Heights is uh, my second favorite Bronte novel. Uh, so I'll put it on there. I'm sure you know it already. Then another doorstopper, uh, a novel that I can't recommend strongly enough. Most people know it for the comic overtones of the first third. Uh it, it shades into deeper and darker stuff, still with a twinkle in its eye the whole time. This is Vanity Fair by William Makepeace Thackeray. These are the books from the Victorian era that you really, you really should read if you're going to read them. Then another Bronte sister. I'm afraid we won't be doing all of them, <laughs> but uh, we have uh, Jane Eyre. This is my favorite uh, Bronte sister novel. I, I don't. I pulled all of these covers from the internet. I don't know why this one is so ugly. I don't know why she has a horse running around in her dress, but uh, I think I probably do know why, but this is just dumb signaling melodrama. The only innocent thing on the cover is the bunny rabbit. <laughs> but, uh, but the book is not. The book is, uh, I think, it's really good. It's really sharp and fierce and feral like all the other Bronte sister stuff. But this is also the one that I think is closest to being uh, joyful as well, at, in parts. There's an element here that I don't find in any other Bronte sister work, so I thought I'd include it. Now, of course, if we're talking about serious literature and we're talking about the Victorian era, uh, sorry, I know the baby's cute, but <laughs> it, it ruins the starter kid if she has her entire head up her butt. <laughs> uh, when we're talking about serious literature in the Victorian era, one name has to come up. I know that as well as anybody else. I'm not going to... I'm not going to shape this list without that name. That name, of course, is Charles Dickens. Now, I've made no secret of the fact on this channel that Charles Dickens really doesn't do it for me. I keep trying, and I will keep trying. I don't believe in this case that it often when an author doesn't do anything for me, I have made up my, my critic's mind on the author. But sometimes an author doesn't do it for me, and I know the problem is me and not the author. So I will, I will keep trying. And if you're going to read Charles Dickens, you should probably read David Copperfield uh, for, for Victober. It also is a bit of a doorstopper, but Dickens is certainly entertaining. He is certainly entertaining. The reason, the, the reason I've been able to put my finger on why he doesn't do it for me is that I don't think he respects you as a reader. I think he thinks that, that uh, corny entertainment is all he needs to do for you to entertain you, and that that's all you want, and if he gives you that, he doesn't have to do anything else. He can resort to the, the dumbest melodrama. And that'll be okay because, you know, he'll be laughing behind his hand at how cheesy it is and you won't notice because all you care about are the whiz-bangs and the plot twists. Uh, I, I could be wrong about that. Certainly every biogra biographical treatment that I've read of Dickens tells me that I was wrong about that, but it's the feeling I get from the books. There's no way to discount that. Uh, so, what's the melodrama going on here? Are you going to get down from there, baby? Huh? You're distracting everybody, so we might as well pay attention to you. There we go. All right. Uh, so when it comes to Dickens, of course, he had rivals 
in the fiction world. We've already seen one of them. We'll see another one because this is an author I also want to strongly recommend. And obviously the hosts of Victober also want to recommend this author. This is Anthony Trollope. And this is his book, The Way We Live Now, his great big social commentary novel, uh, which is the, re the group read for 2023's Victober. So if you're looking at this thing, if it's on your shelf, it's a big thing. It's wonderful. We've done read-alongs of it on this channel. I'm strongly considering doing something like that for Victober this year anyway, even though I've talked about it endlessly. If you see it on your shelf or at the library and you're thinking, eh, that's pretty big, you're never going to have better company to do a group read of it with than the, all the folks at Victober. So you might want to give it a try and see what all the fuss is about. I assure you, it is very good. Uh, so then we're, we're done with so-called serious fiction. And now we move on to nonfiction and poetry. We'll, we'll range around, for the middle group, we'll range around nonfiction and poetry because the Victorians excelled at everything. Keep in mind, it wasn't just fiction. They excelled at everything. Poetry, stage plays, philosophy, natural history, architecture, sculpting, painting, <laughs> civic engineering, railroads, bridges, engines of any kind. They excelled at everything. Something was in the air. Uh, and so we'll go through a few, we'll stick to books, and we'll go through a few of those. The first, the next one here is it's a work of philosophy. It is brilliant. It is steeply brilliant. It's the hardest book in many ways on this list, uh, but only because I really didn't get into the weeds on John Ruskin, or that would have done it. This is On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. Uh, it is it is in its own elephantine way readable. <laughs> it's, I know that's a, a little bit of a guarded recommendation. It is a kind of readable. It's not long. And it is brilliant. Uh, so if you're wondering what was creating the atmosphere of the, the, the intellectual atmosphere of the Victorian era for, for the, you know, the 1%, the dons and the people who were like to scour over books like this, this book, one other book by John Stuart Mill, one other book by one other writer, they are the things that did it. So, uh, <laughs> you could, I'm sure you could find a good annotated edition forever and ever. There was a Norton Critical Edition of On Liberty. You really do need annotations for this book, I would think. And there's one other book on this list that you also badly need annotations for, unfortunately. Uh, and it's this next one. Uh, because all kinds of writing saw a noonday great in the Victorian era. All kinds of writing did. So <laughs> I have to include Apologia Pro Vita Sua. Uh, by John Henry Newman, who was, as you can see, a, a pinched-faced cleric for the church. <laughs> uh, he was quarrelsome and nitpicky. This whole thing, or this whole book, arose from a nitpick. But it, nevertheless, is brilliant. It will sweep you along. Eventually, give it, with Victorian writing of any kind, you, except for the last category of books that we're going to be dealing with, with Victorian writing of most kinds, you need to give it time to sweep you along, because it was counting on that. The 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 mind frame of the era was not our own mind frame. People had longer attention spans. They were willing to give a book a lot more time to set the table and pull out the chairs than we do now. If you give this the time, you will find it amazing. It is, at its heart, unbelievably honest, and therefore takes its rank as one of the greatest religious autobiographies since St. Augustine's Confessions. I hate to say it about John Henry Newman, but nevertheless, you will feel it when you read it. Find a good annotated edition, read a good introduction, and then launch on. Uh, like I said, we'll deal with, for this group here, this middle grouping, we'll deal with nonfiction and with poetry. Of course, when you're talking about poetry, the Victorian era was lousy with great poets, <laughs> and I want to include a few of them, and of course I want to make room for Alfred Lord Tennyson. <laughs> of course I do. And we'll, for here, we'll do the Idols of the King. Which is, uh, I mean, this uh, any any Tennyson volume will have more than just the Idols of the King. The only one, the only thing you'll really get from him that doesn't, that might stand on its own, is In Memoriam, which is quintessentially Victorian in so many ways. But this is too. The Victorians loved uh, the mytho history of England. So, and this is what that is what this is. This is Alfred Lord Tennyson doing poetic riffs and meditations and little dramatic bits on the Arthurian myth cycle. And it's wonderful. Just wonderful. Uh, it had its counterparts. Tennyson had his counterparts in France. He had his counterparts in America, certainly. 
but we're going to stick to England and a little bit of Ireland. So uh, then the next one we'll do, we'll, we'll do a couple more poets here. Uh, Cause you got to keep Aaron Facer happy. Right? We'll do Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Uh, I pulled, I pulled this cover just off the internet. What you'd really ideally want would be a big collection of hers that has Aurora Lee, her long poem and also all the shorter ones. But I don't actually know what versions of her are currently available. I don't know if there is such a volume. It'd be great. I can picture it in my mind. A long, wonderful introduction, great notes, and everything in one big, huge volume. But uh, I don't know if that exists. Certainly, you, your library will be able to help you out there. We should also deal with history. I put a couple of history titles on here because the Victorians also excelled at that. And once again, you see that something was in the air, not just in England, but everywhere, because the, the work that was being done in Germany on the writing, the researching and writing and thinking, conceiving of popular and, and academic works of history at this time was is being born. It was effectively being born in this time period. I wanted to put, I looked around for things that weren't abstruse enough to put off a general reader. Uh, and I think I've had a couple <laughs> that will work. They're also big. This one is huge. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a story of, you know, 1789 of the French Revolution, but it is incredibly good. And it's not, it doesn't read like you would expect. It's a whirlwind of impressions and dramatic effects. I hate always when I'm talking about history, I hate, I hate always to use the typical critic's phrase of a book that reads like a novel because good history reads like good history, <laughs> not like a novel. But you'll know what I mean when I say that, and that is definitely this. If you look at this big, huge thing on your library shelf, for instance, and you're thinking, oh my God, it's some crusty old Victorian writing about a huge 1,000-page book about the French Revolution. No, thank you. Give it a try. Definitely give it a try. I bet you'll find that its register is completely different from what you're thinking. Which is not true for our next book. <laughs> our next book is a, is a huge work of history. It was a gigantic bestseller in the Victorian era. Everyone either knew about it or bought a copy and had it on their shelf or actually bought a copy and read it. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's tremendous reading fun. Once you get into the rhythm of it, you have to give the Victorians their time to set the table and pull out the chairs. You have to do that because that's the whole reading ethos that they were writing for was that. So if you don't give them that, and you can, but if you don't give them that, you're going to miss out on 90% of the joys of this reading time. This next book, you might need to give it a little more than 30 pages. The author is great. The author is Thomas Babington Macaulay, and this is his book, uh, The History of England. Uh, I just pulled these covers off off the internet, so I don't know how much of his book is included in this Penguin Classic. He wrote part of this book, and it's the thing that took off like a skyrocket. And then he kept writing and added to it. I would hope that a Penguin volume would have everything, but you never know. Used secondhand copies of Macaulay are not hard to find, I don't think. And they're also not going to be valued, because we have this weird idea that history, that older histories aren't any good anymore. I, I don't agree with that at all. But, uh, Macaulay was a great prose stylist. You'll see that when you read him. Uh, then if we stick with uh, with nonfiction just for a bit, just for one more book here, uh, I want to finish up the nonfiction section with the most important work of nonfiction in the Victorian Renaissance, if we call it that, but also in the history of humanity. There are very important books in the history of humanity that are written by committees, obviously. Some of them have been tremendously, all, a handful of religious texts written by committees have totally affected the shape of the world. But the most important book written by an individual, by far, was written in the Victorian era. I'm, of course, referring to The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, in which he codifies all of his observations from years previous about natural mechanisms that may be responsible for a life on Earth, the life on Earth that we see around us. Darwin was writing before genetics were known. He was writing before DNA was known. He was writing before most of the, the heart of his theories could be confirmed. He did live long enough to see some of his predictions confirmed. Uh, but the basic superstructure of the process that he describes, which is uh, evolution by means of natural selection, that basic process, even without those building blocks, has turned out to be un, un, incredibly sound. Darwin, as, Charles, as uh, Richard Dawkins said, made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, for instance. It was the furthest thing in the world from Darwin's mind to do that when he wrote this book. But he was proposing an idea that was, in its own mild-mannered, country-curate way, 
a thermonuclear explosion. Readers of this book immediately sensed the unbelievably seismic paradigm shift that it represents. Because if, this process, if the processes described in this book are true, then they have always been true. It's not like they kick-started last week. They've always been true. Darwin was positing a world in which animals, in which populations, fight for genetic representation in the next generation. And that they always have. That replicating organisms of any kind have always done that. And that that, over time, will lead to all the variety of species that we see today. The over time being crucial. Darwin is building his book on Sir Charles Lyell, on the work of, of Sir Charles Lyell, which says, if we look at the processes in the world today, they are happening, but they are happening very slowly. And that probably means this is a very old world. Not 6,000 years old. Not created by magic 6,000 years ago, but very, very old. If we assume that everything in the past happened the way it happens now, then if you look at how slowly mountains are accreting, how slowly coastlines are eroding, Sir Charles I.L. thought, well, if you look at all of those things, that, that means this is probably a very old world and has always been gradually changing the way we see it changing now. Darwin built on that and said, well, if that's true, if it's true for, for rocks and mountains, it could be true for animals, for living organisms. And if it's true for living organisms, that would explain a lot. The seismic paradigm shift in the book that I don't think Darwin quite thought out was that the main thing that would change is that it would remove gods from the world. This book removes gods from the world. It, it says everything that you're looking at developed naturally, which would explain not only how exquisitely adapted some living things are to the world around them, but also it would explain all the mistakes. It would explain all the weird stuff as well. It would explain everything. But subsequent research has done nothing but strengthen Darwin's, Darwin's core argument here, and it's all out in this book. 1859, with the world not suspecting at all was what was going to happen. Suddenly everyone was talking about it. And that makes it important enough to read on its own. But I also want to stress, what I always try to stress when I bring up this book, again, if you give it the Victorian 30 pages, the Victorian time to set its stage, it is wonderful writing. It's a very one of the most enjoyable scientific treaties that I've ever read, that's for sure. So had to be on this list. But we go from... Evolution by means of natural selection. We go from Darwinian evolution. Uh, that's the height. That and John Stuart Mill are the height of the intellectual challenges that for the Victorian era. I, I've left John Ruskin off this list because I don't think the Victorian era really knew what he was. I don't think anyone has ever actually accounted for all of Ruskin. Uh, it's easy to account for him if you just skim his works. But if you don't, oh my God. <laughs> so I left him off. I just rudely left him off. So we're going to move now to, we're going to finish up this list with more popular stuff. But I put, you know, the, the Gen C air quotes over that because, I, again, I don't agree with a lot of those differentiations between so-called serious literature and the books that we're going to talk about now. But nevertheless, all, the Victorian tide lifted all boats. And some of Victorian popular literature is still cultural shorthand today. Some of it was as popular as literature has ever been. So I thought we should I thought we should finish up the list with those, starting uh, with H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds, which I know, here I know the science fiction dude bros are going to quibble, but this book started science fiction. It started the genre of science fiction. I know people will will for instance say I thought you loved Jules Verne. I absolutely do, but uh, but this book started science fiction, and. Uh, it's terrific. It's 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 unbalanced. It's it's poorly balanced reading, but a lot of the th the stuff we're going to be looking at here is poorly balanced because this stuff was being written at speed, with white hot inspiration for a paying audience and impatient editors. Most of it was, so you, it's going to have a different register. It's going to feel different, but this is fundamental. So you, you if for these these uh, popular potboiler sentimental tearjerker books or a popular you know, uh, twist a minute books, their authors at the time would never have thought that in a hundred years their books would be called important. H.G. Wells would because he was a raving egomaniac, but most of them wouldn't. And yet, you cannot really talk about a lot of the genres that we deal with today without looking at this stuff. Uh, and this next one, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful, it will break your heart. It is, it is a wonderful tearjerker of a novel. It's much better 
as a pro's experience than a lot of people give it credit. It's diehard fans are always saying that and always being sort of snickered at because people have re reduced it to a children's book. Nevertheless, it's not only a wonderful reading experience, but it's also an important book in a different way than its reading experience. This is Anna Sewell. This is Black Beauty. And the reason why it's important is because one of the many ways that the Victorian era flourished, one of its many incredible waves of inspiration, was a gigantic increase in what a friend of mine used to refer to as pointless compassion. The Victorian era saw the rise of animal welfare societies, of the anti-vivisection protestations, of uh, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And you might think, well, if that's what you're talking about, then why don't you just give us the 19th century version of Peter Singer's Animal Liberation? And what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is that this book is that and serve that function for a huge part of the Victorian era. Keep in mind, the broader Victorian era, the non-English Victorian era, also saw another novel do this same thing, where there were tracts and there were uh, articles in papers and newspapers and whatnot, but the thing that brought across the realities of a subject across the Atlantic wasn't anything nonfiction. It was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Same thing here. This book is from the viewpoint of a horse, which makes it, the cruelties of the Victorian era's treatment of animals absolutely inescapable, and it works. It absolutely works. And the point is, I know now it's, it's seen as kind of a treacly children's classic, but when it came out, it got in amongst hearts and minds in a way that a hectoring tract would not. Same thing across the Atlantic. I, you, know, I, you know I love William Lloyd Garrison. He is my boy. But he spent, he, he spent his entire lifetime writing those hectoring tracts about the evils of slavery. None of them were even a, a millionth as effective as Uncle Tom's Cabin. Same thing with this book. It raised a, a, the, the compassionate consciousness of an era in a way that no nonfiction work did. So, I would be on this list for both those reasons. It's actually a more graceful reading experience than people tend to think who've never read it but only read about it. Uh, then we get to, we'll continue in, in, in so-called lowbrow fiction. I'm only saying that on this channel because frequent viewers of this channel know that I don't use lowbrow as an insult. Uh, when we're talking about this next book, we are no longer talking about a beautiful reading experience. <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, I have read this next book more times than any book on this list, even some of the later books that we're going to get to. This is Dracula by Bram Stoker. Which is about Count Dracula. <laughs> it's about what is one of the features, one of the many, many immortal characters or concepts that were created in the Victorian Renaissance. One of many, many that were like that. Look at uh, relatively comparable literary renaissances from later eras. You might find one character, maybe two. The Victorian era has ten. At a walk, ten. <laughs> so this is, I need not introduce this. I have done read-alongs and read-alouds. This is the story, Bram Stoker's story of Count Dracula, of vampires. And the same thing for this next one. It also has entered into the common parlance. We People know what this refers to, even though they don't even know that it's a book and certainly have never read it. This is Robert Louis Stevenson, who I love. I, I would bridle. I would bridle at calling Black Beauty a children's book. And I would bridle, I have always bridled at the way that people just reflexively call Stevenson a children's author. He had a complicated relationship with that characterization, even while he was writing his books. Uh, but I'm choosing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We all know that. We all know that phrase. It is immortal. And never, never mind that it's Count Orlock on the cover here. I don't really know what, what Nosferatu is doing on the cover here. But you know the story, even if you haven't read it. Well, this is not a Victorian doorstopper. This would take you an hour to read. And you should. If you don't know it, you should. And there are a million editions of this and a lot of other things that Stevenson wrote. Um, and this next author, I had to put him on this list. Not only because he wrote one of my favorite books. In fact, I might be wrong about Dracula. I might have read this book more often than I've read Dracula. Certainly I know it by heart. But I put this author on this list also out of defiance. Because uh, the, the censorious judgmental, puritanical 21st century has canceled this author. Uh, so he's not on reading lists, he's not on curricula, and he's great. And of course I'm referring to Richard Kipling. And he has been canceled because he has been viewed, rightly, as an advocate for the benefits of imperialism, which was the watchword of the Victorian era. He is, he is viewed, rightly, as an advocate for the benefits 
of that system of colonialization. And, of course, the, the censors uh, who smear him for that and want him canceled from reading this because of that overlook the fact that he was also an incredibly trenchant critic of that same thing. He wrote about the subject. But he didn't always write about the subject. He wasn't constantly banging on about imperialism. So, uh, in, sometimes, uh, quite often, he wrote great books. It's a shame if an entire generation of young readers is being told not to read him. That's a shame. That would be a shame. That would be a real loss to them. And the book I want to include on this list here is The Jungle Book. Now, this is, the, I think, a cover from the first Jungle Book. He wrote two. And they are great. They are absolutely great. They, they start off as being a mishmash of natural stories. Sort of a, kind of a, 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 a slightly more complex and adult version of his Just So stories. But eventually, a through line, a narrative through line about a, the little boy Mowgli emerges from these stories and takes over. So the second Jungle Books takes over that story. And it is wonderful. If you only know about these things from the various adaptations that you may have seen, and you've never read the books, you really should. There's a lot more going on here than you think. <laughs> There's a lot more going on here than just silly animal stories. Uh, they get more and more complex as they go along, and more and more wonderfully done. Just wonderfully done. I know I'm biased, because I love them anyway, but there's a lot here. It would be a shame if these if these went away. Uh, and then, to finish up this part of a Victorian starter kit, we're dealing here with kind of what would what would t traditionally be called kind of lowbrow stuff, not high literature. And we will finish up this section and this list with, uh, <laughs> with uh, quite possibly, if not Dracula, quite possibly the greatest of all of those that would fit under that category. And that, you know, snubs its nose at anyone who's trying to look down on it because success is the ultimate is the ultimate yardstick of some forms of public validation when you think of this sort of thing immortal characters created in the victorian era you think of sherlock holmes sir arthur Conan doyle's uh world's only unofficial consulting amateur detective 221 b baker street the the initials vr that holmes has shot into the wall of 221 b baker street stands for Victoria Regnant. It's, he was a, a proud subject of the Queen. The Victorian era, with its incredibly unhealthy fogs and its deference to authority and its miserable lives for the poor, all kinds of Victorian stuff is reflected in these stories, but they are also slam-bang entertainment, just, just like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, just like Dracula, just like Jungle Books. These, the books that I'm, that I'm talking about in this last part of this starter kit do not require the Victorian... 30 pages. They do not require you to wait while someone carefully lays out the table and pulls out the chair. They do not require that at all. And that's the reason why endless millions of people have loved these things. So, <laughs> so I want to end by recommending Sherlock Holmes. None of these people really need my recommendation. Even, even Newman doesn't really need my recommendation. But these are the giant things from the Victorian era. And I was being parsimonious. I could have doubled this list. Uh, but the, this video has gone on quite long enough. The, I thought for to begin, to kick off October, before I get into the weeds with particular authors or other questions, I thought we'd do a starter kit of authors that you really shouldn't miss from the Victorian era. Uh, there are others. There are lots of others. But this will do for a list for now. Uh, so I'll wrap this up. I'm hoping that you're all going to enjoy Victober. I'm hoping that even in your crowded reading list, I know all of you are constantly cramming on books to read, I'm hoping that you'll make room for at least one Victorian work in October. I know the month is busy and you've got a lot of other things to read, but I hope that you participate in one of BookTube's greatest events by making room for one Victorian author. And keep in mind, some of the things on this list are fairly short. Read a couple of stories in the second Jungle Book. Read a couple of home stories if you've never read them. Read all of Dracula. <laughs> read little things like that. Even try Black Beauty. I'm not saying that in order to in order to do Victober, you have to slog your way through Apologia Pro Vita Sua or, or the French Revolution. Although, there's a lot of enjoyment there. I made a point of trying to skew this list for accessible things, hence the absence of John Ruskin. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, and I'd love to hear in the comments, oh my god, I would love to hear what you plan if you are planning on doing victober what are you planning on doing oh my god tell me all in the comments or email me tell me all about your plans for victober uh, so anyway uh i will wrap this up we will be seeing more victorian stuff this month you can bet on it especially since i have a gorgeous michael k vaughn custom-made thumbnail 
<laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, but I'll be back to the subject. Thank you, BookTube.